Welcome back to another episode of the Success Story Podcast. I am sitting down for the second time with Captain Hoff, Stephen Hoffman. He is the founder of Founderspace. It is one of the leading, fastest growing startup incubators in Silicon Valley. He works with entrepreneurs globally. Uh, I brought him back on the show because the first time we just spoke about his career and we, we started to dive into entrepreneurship and some of the things that he's learned, but now we really, really go deep. He speaks about everything from uh, fundraising versus bootstrap what to look for when you're bringing on VCs, how to scale your company, how to take a product to market, how to market your company, your product, how to sell your product, talks about uh, exiting, IPOing, um, selling. So he really goes through everything. It's a great podcast. I was actually super, super happy with how in-depth he goes and how tactical he gets. So if you have ever thought about starting a business, this is a podcast for you. Um, Also, I just want to say thank you to the sponsor of today's show, BKA Content. They are one of the best sources to go for content for your website, your blog, your business. Again, they have a special offer. Stick around until around uh, halfway through the podcast and you'll hear the special offer from BKA Content. Anyways, stay tuned. Stephen Hoffman, this is an entrepreneur masterclass. All right, let's get right into it. Thanks again for joining me. I am sitting down with Captain Hoff, Steve Hoff, Steve Hoffman, excuse me. We've uh, we've chatted before. He's been on the podcast. This is actually, you're the first repeat guest. So I'm excited about this uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, you have a new book out um, and a lot of guests do have books, of course. But what we're going to be talking about today is the work that you're doing with Founder Space entrepreneurship startups. Um, if you have not listened to the first podcast, so Steve Hoffman, Captain Hoff, um, he is the he is the captain, I was gonna say founder, captain and CEO of Founder Space. Founder Space is one of the world's leading accelerators. He's a venture investor, serial entrepreneur. He is uh, the award-winning author of several books. Last time we spoke to him, uh, I think we were speaking about Make Elephants Fly, and now we're speaking about Surviving a Startup. Um, you work with entrepreneurs all day, every day, you invest in entrepreneurs, you help entrepreneurs grow, scale their businesses. I'm going to, I'm going to just ask a brief, a brief like overview of how you got to where you were today. Cause I know last time we went through all of your time in production and working with different studios. And then eventually I think you, you had a, an app or, or several different companies that you exited and then now you're doing this. So. Well, if, if this is the first time people have ever, you know, listened to, to you speak on the show, give us a little bit of a rundown of, of where you're from and, uh, and what you're doing. So I have done a lot. So I've been an entrepreneur for decades, and that is why I wrote this book, really putting everything I learned in doing three venture-funded startups myself, plus working with, investing in, and mentoring hundreds of startups around the world and seeing all the problems they run into and figuring out, you know, how do you solve these problems without, you know, destroying your company without sinking? Because honestly, like 90% of startups fail. So I've been there, I've had very successful startups and I've had failures and I have tried lots of different things. And for me, uh, you know, my mission now is really to empower entrepreneurs around the world and to help them learn from each other. So let's first tee up founder space. There's a lot of different um, incubators in the world. There's a lot of different groups that support entrepreneurs. What is founder space? What does it do? What type of entrepreneurs do you attract? What do you help them with? Venture funding, growth, scaling, whatever. Founder space was actually one of the early uh, incubators and accelerators in Silicon Valley. So we started uh, back in 2011, uh, working with entrepreneurs, so a decade ago, uh, helping them with everything they needed. And really, it started just with me helping out my friends and then expanded from there and grew globally. Our format is a little different from Y Combinator, 500 Startups, or other accelerators here in Silicon Valley in that we are truly a global accelerator. So we have over 50 partners in 22 countries. We are working, we have like multiple incubators, you know, in China and other places. And I am constantly traveling. 
So right now, I'm a digital nomad. I have no home. So I go, I, my goal is not to, originally my goal, founder space goal was to bring all these entrepreneurs to Silicon Valley, you know, and help make them successful. Now our goal is to bring Silicon Valley to the rest of the world, really bring our teaching, our knowledge, our resources, our venture capital to cities that are often underserved to countries that really need to tap into this to grow. And and so I, now, I, now I understand, so you are evangelizing startups. And what are some of the um, lessons that you've learned going to cities that aren't obviously considered the traditional startup hub? Oh, it's been, it's been an amazing experience because every culture is different. Like if you work with startups from Romania or the UK or Indonesia or China or Japan, it's all different, right? Because it's rooted in the culture. So there are a lot of decisions people make, how they communicate, how funding is done, that's different in each of these countries. But there's also fundamental thing, you know, we're humans and, and we're functioning in a, in a capitalistic society. So these elements remain the same. And I've learned a lot of things. For example, China's a very different country uh, in terms of doing business. And in China, you have to do business based on relationships. So Chinese entrepreneurs spend an inordinate amount of time uh, working on building deep relationships with their peers, uh, with investors, with the government, with everybody. It's a network. And it's the, your network is so powerful. It's not as individualistic as here in the United States. And in China, you have to understand that what you write in a contract doesn't matter. It's what your relationship is that matters. If your relationship is strong, you don't even need a written agreement. Things will just happen and people will do what they say. But if your relationships are weak, and this is where most Westerners stumble going into Eastern culture, then you can have all the legal documents you want and, and it doesn't make any difference. Now, these are, these are interesting, very interesting insights because I don't think I've ever spoken to, I, I've spoken to a lot of individuals that support startups. I've spoken to a lot of people that have built companies in North America. Um, I don't think I've ever really spoken to somebody that uh, builds or, or really focuses on building companies overseas. Um, I'm curious, and maybe you can dovetail this into lessons also for, for North America as well. When you're starting a company, um, and, and like when I was looking through the table of contents of your book, I like how it's sort of structured because you're literally going through um, the different phases of growth of a company. You, you speak about launching, venture capital, uh, growth marketing, guerrilla marketing, growth hacking, whatever you want to call it, uh, finding your mojo, so I guess scaling, and then um, building a billion dollar business, which could be you know exiting, scaling, IPO, whatever it may be. Um, so starting at the beginning, that's, that's sort of my concept for, for chatting with you. If you want to go into something else, it's fine, but that was sort of my concept. So starting at the beginning, do you find that the lessons um, learned overseas for, for or the the motivations for starting a startup are similar? They are and they aren't. So America, we tend to have this idealism. Uh, so a lot of people in the United States, and, and it's true of Europe too, they will latch onto an idea that they believe means something personally to them. You know, it could be a social value they have like climate change and they want to make a big difference or helping the homeless or education, or it could be something personal to them that they just love, they're, they're crazy about. And they will pursue that idea even if it seems like it's not going to work. Like even if all the odds are stacked against them, even if everybody tells them it's impossible, if they believe they can do it, they will do it. And a great example of this is Elon Musk. So we look at Elon Musk and he decided he was gonna take humanity to Mars. Why do we need to go to Mars? Well, in his mind, he sees himself as the savior of humanity, right? We have to get off this planet or we stand a chance of being hit by an asteroid and wiping out, uh, wiping ourselves, you know, which would just obliterate the human race. So there's some catastrophe that could, if we're stuck on one planet, we're vulnerable. So he set this off and he, you know, all the scientists said it's impossible, everything, and he just keeps going, right? He's gonna, he's determined to do it in his lifetime. Now, you go to other countries, a lot of them, because 
uh, of their culture be, uh, because of, you know, a lot of these are group cultures, especially in Asia. So you look around you and you, you, most people do not go against the flow of the group. They stick with the flow because that's how the culture uh, dictates you're a good citizen and you get ahead and everything else. And in these cultures, they often discard those ideas. So they will try uh, things that they are pretty sure will work and, and instead of taking huge risks. So that um, and that are in line kind of with what other people are thinking. So that's a big difference about how they approach business. Also in like South Korea is the hardest working country in the world. You know, people work more hours in South Korea than any other country. Japan, you know, people die working, you know, China, people work incredibly hard in the West. Uh, we get we and they tend to be hierarchical societies. So their startups are structured around these hierarchies. You know, the, the boss uh, is the boss. Right. And you don't contradict the boss. And it's very true of all these Asian cultures. And you get to the West and we have, again, a more individualistic streak. I mean, we still have a lot of the same pressures with the boss and everything else. But on average, we tend to be uh, we tend to like to defy authority more. We tend to. Uh, a lot, permit our employees to speak back, speak up, go another direction more often than you would find in, in Asian cultures. And this fundamentally shapes how startups operate. Now, you, there is no right way. That's what I've learned. We can say our way is best. Well, we grew up with this way. Um, there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained by more hierarchical structures where everybody bonds together and works together and as a group than more individualist. But in individualist societies, people can be more creative, more expressive. You can get more dissent, more discussion. So both of them have their strengths. And we kind of see it play out as these companies grow into very big you know, unicorns and beyond. Would you? So I guess these are things that you'd have to take into consideration if you're looking to go into other markets, obviously. Um, do you find that, uh, I, well, actually, let me rephrase. What would be the benefits of going into a market that's not your own at a startup stage when it's, it is already difficult to find customers, to grow, to scale? If you're already dealing with all these hindrances and pressures that a regular startup would face, what would be the benefit to going overseas and to understand other cultures and to grow into other cultures and sell to those markets? This is what I tell entrepreneurs. Pick your market. Like, don't try to tackle the world. Don't, you know, mm -hmm. you have limited resources. You're a small company. It's hard enough to succeed in a single market, let alone mm -hmm. in multiple markets at the same time. And we've seen this, you know, like Uber went into China and failed, right? Because it's a very different yeah. market, very hard. They had to sell out, exit the market. Many other companies have had similar experiences. You know, some companies couldn't even get in like Facebook. and. Even going abroad to a more similar culture, let's say you're in the US and you want to expand to Australia or to the UK, it's still, it's a different system. So I always recommend to entrepreneurs, pick a big market to begin with. Like, you know, the US is great and just go all in on the US, ignore the rest of the world. I mean, usually when you build a product for the US, people, you know, because of the nature of the internet, you will get users from all over the world anyway, which is great. Um, but. You know, if you're from a small c country like Taiwan, let's say, or, you know, Cyprus or some other country, you know, there's no market there. Literally, you have to pick a bigger market to go into. So even in Europe, which is a sp supposedly a single market, it's actually multiple markets because of the culture, you know, and the language differences, you know, Germany and France and Italy and all of these are different markets that you have to tackle differently. So. I always just say, pick a relatively big market and put all your energy into it. And only once you're going really strong, consider other markets. Smart. Uh, okay. So let's very, very smart. Um, and let's, let's talk about some of those. So there's like 19 different rules that you have to pay attention to when you're, when you're launching a startup or 19 different concepts that you should look into. I, I like how you broke this down. So let's, you know, at a high level, what somebody wants to start something. What what should they think about when they're when they're first starting uh, a company? Say say North America, because I'm in, I'm almost positive <laughs> it's like ninety ninety nine percent of the audience that would be listening to this. But what should they think about? So I tell entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of people have this misconception. They believe that when they start a company, 
the idea is so important and they should like spend all their time iterating on like what's the perfect idea I could launch with and honestly you know your idea is not the most important thing because most likely that idea will change like when you begin your idea if it's new if it's groundbreaking it hasn't been tested by nature right if it's really innovative it, and it almost has to be by nature for a small startup to grow into a unicorn you have to have something very special very new so if it's that new then you don't have the data to know if it will work or not so don't waste a lot of time of thinking you know trying to come up with the perfect idea instead pick a direction you're interested in and then spend 80 percent of your time on one thing one thing at the beginning building your team now people don't think about this like they want to build the product they want to raise venture capital they want to you know go out there and get press or whatever they're going to do but they don't spend enough time building their team they often so many entrepreneurs overlook this and i will tell you uh, the team is going to define your success not you you're one person one person never built a billion dollar company ever like you have to have, if you're going to build a unicorn you need if you want to build a small solo business fine you know you can ignore the team piece but if you really want to grow and scale a company you need an excellent team to start with and you need a team with skills that you don't necessarily possess so i tell on most entrepreneurs honestly the reason 90 percent fail you know and this is why i call it surviving a startup is i want to show you what you need to do every step of the way to survive is the reason they fail is because they com they compromise on their team members it's like they'll they don't know a lot of let's say they have an idea they want to explore but they don't know the right engineers they will take whoever comes their way you know whoever you know it happens to be available somebody they know or somebody they bumped into but they aren't the best look if you're going to build the best company in the world if you're going to be number one in your market which is what you have to be if you're going to be a unicorn you have to be the market leader you're going to need absolutely the best team which means the best people in every area you know technical area design business and sales if you can't get top-notch people forget it don't even start if you get top-notch yeah. people i guarantee you you will come up with the right idea All right, pause for a second. I have to thank the sponsor of today's show, BKA Content. What is BKA Content? Well, it is a service that provides you with the best quality content, copy, written content for your website, your blog, wherever you want to put it. Listen, I'm a marketer. I've built out marketing departments. I've built out uh, teams that have built a very successful SEO campaigns. And if you don't have a strong blog, if you don't have copy, strong copy that converts, that drives people to check out your website to sign up for a demo to purchase a product you are missing out content is king you've heard this before and bka content is the best content writing agency i've tried and i've tried a lot i've tried outsource people i've tried freelancers on a variety of freelance services the stuff you get back from these places when you try and save money it's garbage you have to edit it it's tons of work you know this so bka content is a monthly subscription that provides you as much content as you need for your blog your social your website, whatever it may be. They give you a dedicated account manager. They're going to do their keyword research. They're going to understand your product, your persona, your brand, and the content they're going to deliver to you is top quality. It's premium. And you do not need to keep editing it after you get the content from them. It's keyword optimized, SEO optimized. Your month's worth of blog posts will be delivered to your inbox ready to publish. If you don't believe me, don't stress because you don't have to pay to try it out. They're giving a special offer to everybody who's listening to this to the success story podcast you get one month of content free so when you sign up you get a month of content free you can try their service you can see the quality of their service so go to bkacontent.com slash success that's bkacontent.com slash success and claim your one month free of content and never worry about content copy or writing ever again So how, how do you find those? So follow up question, very good points. How do you find those people? What do you what do you look for? How do you how do you as a as a first time entrepreneur, a lot of noise out there, a lot of resumes are going to come your way, right? If you put up some job adverts, where do you go to find these people? What do you look for? 
That is a question I get asked by every entrepreneur after <laughs> I, I tell them. It's, it's not, I, yeah. I tell them, you know, your team is subpar. You know, I try to be honest with them, but but kind, right? I'm like, you you guys, you know, you don't have a killer team. You're never going to produce a killer product or, you know, beat out your competitors. Focus on this. They're like, but I can't afford it. I have no money. Like, I can't, you know, I can't even pay people. And I tell them, the number one test of a great CEO, and this is what I look for. Like if I'm a, I'm a venture capitalist, so when I fund entrepreneurs, I say, the first test you have is to find a great team without any money. Like if you can't do that, why should I trust you with millions of dollars, you know, or any amount of my money? Because if you can't even, you know, convince people to join you at the beginning uh, because they believe in you, how are you going to get investors believe in you? How are you going to sell customers? How are you going to sell the world on your vision? You need that ability. So that leadership ability. So I tell them, first of all, it's not going to be easy. Like there is no magic wand. I could pretend I'm going to give you a magic wand for, you know, that will make all these people appear. But honestly, what it is, is it's getting out of your shell. It is engaging with other people, not at the beginning. You don't have money most likely, right? Unless you're already successful, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or somebody like that. You have as much money as you need. You don't have money. You, you don't have other resources. But what you do have is your ability to communicate as a leader. So you need to go out and you need to engage these people on a deep level, like the belief in your business. And you need to be receptive to their ideas. Remember, if you're going to attract super smart, ambitious people, they want to feel like they're contributing to a project that they believe in that they take ownership of. If you want them to own the idea, you have to let them contribute. You can't just say, this is my idea. You know, I don't want to hear what you think. <laughs> Do you want to join or not? That just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to truly for your core team, right? You have to truly make them a part of the thing. And this is why you don't need a fully flushed out idea. You need a direction that you think is very promising. You need to find people who believe in that direction. And then together you can start to iterate. But by bringing that, you'll find it's absolutely amazing by opening the door and saying, let's build this together. I want to hear what you think. What ideas do you have? Where could we take this? Suddenly these people who are excellent and they may get be getting a job at Google or Facebook or something, they'll quit those jobs because they think, oh my God, because as soon as they start investing their time, all of us do it. We fall in love with it. Like that's what is meaningful to us. So you have to have a meaningful engagement with them and then they will, you know, often it's their project too. At that point, they will just work for you for equity and commit fully. And that is the start of a great relationship. And that is the beginning of a great business. I've always heard, I heard the saying, I think it was from one of the founders of Buffer. Um, he said, if you're hiring for a startup and the first question one of your hires asks is, you know, how much vacation time am I getting or whatnot? <laughs> Nothing wrong with those questions, but those aren't the people that are going to really love a startup environment. They're not going to love it. And that's what, you, that's what you have to have at the beginning. You need to have that love, that passion that probably is an abnormal amount of passion that most people don't have for a company or for their work, right? You have to find people that can even emulate like a, a tenth of a percent of the passion that the founder would have. If you can find those people, that's, that's when you win, but it's that, very difficult. That yeah. is true. Um, it is difficult, but people have that pa a lot of mm -hmm. the people you want have that passion and those people mm -hmm. are out there waiting for somebody to approach them. So mm -hmm. often, uh, I've heard horror stories and lived through horror stories of entrepreneurs. I'll give you an example. There's an entrepreneur I was working with, um, not just one, this happened many t times, but uh, this entrepreneur uh, brought somebody onto their team to do the coding, right? The person was from Google, crack coder, like, and this person was so excited about the project at the beginning. You know, this passion was there, but uh, the person, when he asked the person, this this uh, coder did not want to give up the Google job, right? They, they were like, let me, I want to be safe, right? When this takes off, I'll do it, but I'll do your project on the side. Well, they started off great. And then over time, when things just didn't take off right away, 
the person got distracted. Like at Google, it's not an easy to work at Google. I mean, they, you, they expect a lot out of you. They hire super smart people and they want them to work. So this person got distracted by other obligations he had at Google. And all of a sudden his productivity went boom and the entrepreneur's waiting. Like, where's that passion? What's going on? You know, and weeks go by and should I cut the person and start all over, find somebody else? Don't want to do that. Then they're in this conundrum. You know, they don't know what mm -hmm. to do. Eventually, after several months, they had to cut the person and start all over. So they wasted several months. I, to your point, I say, don't commit to someone unless they'll commit to you, right? So if you want, uh, if you want to get, it's one thing anybody can say they have passion. And some people are truly passionate, but unwilling to commit. Like they're passionate mm -hmm. for a brief period of time, but there's a litmus test. Like, okay, quit your job at Google and let's do this full time. No, I want to do it on the side. Okay, then you're probably not the right person. You just have to say that and move on. Mm -hmm. And um, my, I guess the, the follow-up, because I know this is asked of you a lot, would be when you do have the wrong people in your organization, is there a way around it or do you just have to cut them and rebuild? Is that the only solution? So in a big company, it can afford some, some dead weight. You can afford dead weight if you're Microsoft or any of these huge companies. You know, if people, they, they just, you know, if somebody isn't working out because it's often hard to fire people, uh, the bosses just shunt them off to a corner. <laughs> like yeah. and ignore them. In a startup, you cannot afford an ounce of dead weight. You have to be a lean, mean fighting machine. Like you cannot have any dead weight. Um, and that means that you have to make a decision. Now, I myself have stumbled in this area. My early startups, like I had this engineer who was good friends with my other engineers and they recommended I bring this engineer on. But the engineer actually was not good. Like he was very arrogant. He <laughs> talked a good talk, but his implementation was buggy all the time. It kept crashing. It was a nightmare, but we, Again, after I only found out how, how inept he was, you know, six months in because mm -hmm. we had already, uh, we needed, I didn't, I trusted and I thought he would build. They, they liked him because he was, um, because they were friends, right? But he wasn't the right guy. And, and the system, but we were six months in. I felt like we can't go back six months. It's insane, mm -hmm. right? We spent six months on this. So I stuck with the guy another six months and then another six months. And I will tell you the day I fired him thinking all hell would go loose. Every, I got this new engineer and they just, Oh, this, this system is crap. Totally redid it in a month, in a month. Hmm. And it worked better than it ever had. So I will tell you, you know, cut your losses. The day you realize somebody isn't working out as a startup, you cut them. You literally, cut them right that day and you go in, even if you think your whole company is going to implode and it will set you back six months or whatever it is, just, just do it and find yeah. the right person. Yeah. Very good advice. It's very, it's very hard. And I guess that's why if, uh, you know, I'm sure this will come up at some point, but if you are uh, an entrepreneur and um, you're having to deal with these very difficult personal discussions with people that you've hired on, um, it can be easy to default to literally what you just said. Just keeping them on, keeping them around, keeping everybody happy. So maybe this yeah, is Yeah, I was also worried about why. my other employees who liked him. But it wasn't a question yeah. of whether you like somebody. It's like, are they performing? You know, I didn't want to lower yeah. morale. I didn't want to do... Honestly, you can't worry about those things. You just... In the difficult discussion, you just have to be totally honest. You like... Yeah. You just have to say... The, you know, first of all, you have to give them a warning right away. When you first see the problem. Like, don't ignore it. Like, just state it up front. Put it in writing because that protects you legally and just state it up front. You know, these are the problems. Then you warn them twice, third time out the door. Like, like literally we're cutting the law. It should also, you're right. I like that though. It shouldn't be a surprise. Like it should no, never they, be they, a surprise. They, and you shouldn't worry about lowering their productivity by telling them they're not doing a good job. If they're gonna, honestly, if they're gonna be offended by your words and not step up to the plate, then they aren't the right person for the job. So you just, mm -hmm. It's, it's, you just need to be totally honest, but not in a mean way. Like you don't, yeah. like, you don't have to be mean. You just have to be firm. You just have to be, this is what I expect of you. This is what we need to get done. If we're not going to hit that goal, if the system goes down again, or you don't hit your milestones, then we're going to have to review whether we can keep you on period. Yeah. 
good good advice okay let's move on to let's move on to growth okay so next next two chapters two di very different ways of growing bootstrapping versus uh raising venture capital we can have a quick point about either or but i'm just curious your perspective when should you bootstrap when should you raise venture capital so first of all often you have to bootstrap at the beginning no matter what because like yes. i said most vcs won't jump in and fund you until you have something to show them you know unless you're already famous or you get super lucky you're not going to get the capital until you've made significant progress so you're going to be bootstrapping the real question is when you when and if you decide to accept venture capital now there have been a lot of unicorns created strictly on bootstrapping like you can look at plural site you know this education for you know tech for mm -hmm. Uh, coders, you know, they, these guys went public on bootstrapping. You can do it. You know, um, you can look at, uh, a lot of other stars, MailChimp, for example, they didn't raise capital until much, 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 much later. You know, they didn't have to, they really bootstrapped it all the way to success and only raised capital to add fuel to the fire. So, um, you do not need venture capital. And for a lot of entrepreneurs, honestly, you should never get venture capital because your business isn't a right fit. So unless you are going to be, uh, have exponential growth, like, like we see, unless your business is primed to become, you know, a multi-billion dollar company, don't waste your time. You're only going to frustrate yourself and frustrate your venture uh, capitalists. And it will probably end up not succeeding because you guys will be divergent on your plans. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it, if the, if you want complete control, that's another reason not to go. You could have a big business, but you just don't want to have, when you take on venture capital, you are taking on partners. Like these are your partners. It's like a marriage and marriages can end in really awful divorces. So I, I tell entrepreneurs just for, you know, do, you know, don't get married unless you're sure. Like it's not just getting the money. It's like, do I want this person on my board of directors? When somebody hands you money, even if they're not on your board, they can make your life miserable. You know, I had an investor that we brought on and at a certain point they decided uh, they wanted to take over the company and I said no. And then they threatened lawsuit, you know, lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Like, do I want to be involved in a lawsuit? Running a startup is hard enough. Like <laughs> let alone yeah, the, having your investor. Yeah. So you know what I did? I ended up doing a deal where I gave back the money. I literally like, look, I'm giving you back the money because I just don't want the headache. It's life is too short. I want to focus on building something, not fighting over something that we haven't even proven works yet. Like mm -hmm. we're still trying to figure out. So you need to make sure your visions are aligned, all those things. If they aren't, then just bootstrap it. And honestly, b pick a business that you can bootstrap. You know, there are certain businesses out there that are much easier to bootstrap than others because they bring in revenue early. You know, they have customers early uh, because they scale at a very low cost. You don't need, you know, millions or billions of dollars to scale. Those are the businesses uh, that you may want to consider. And a lot of it, honestly, comes down to your personality type. So, you know, some people are are primed as entrepreneurs to grow big businesses you know they are they are that type of person you know they it, they thrive in that environment other people really want a, a business they can wrap their head around that's smaller that's more personal and there's nothing wrong with that like i've run both types of businesses i did two bootstrap businesses and honestly um it's a great experience and it's a totally different experience and it's just as valid and it may and you can become wealthier than you ever need to be on a bootstrap business like you know if your business is pulling in 10 million dollars a year and you have a very high profit margin whoo you're making multi-million dollars you know how much money can you actually spend in your life like yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. only so much so do you need a unicorn not necessarily to live a great life you need to decide yeah Good, good advice. Um, okay, so I still want to, yes, I, I think that for most people, if they're just getting started, of course, they'll have to bootstrap and that could probably be a very, um, very sustainable way to grow your business and probably a less stressful way to grow your business. But still, some people will want to raise uh, venture capital money. So if you're looking for investors, just some best, best tips for looking for investors, you don't have to go too deep, there's a lot there, but at a high level, what would be some key takeaways for looking for venture capital money? So I'll give you a few things. Number one, research the venture capitalists. Like, 
Are they investing in your space? Like, you know, most venture capitalists already have what they call a thesis, an idea of where they want to invest and what is a good investment at this period of time. If you align with their thesis, what's in their head, when you walk in the door, you know, if you do a halfway decent pitch to them, they will fund you. Like literally, they are waiting for certain types of companies to come walking in their door. If you are off their radar, if you're in an area that they are not hot on right now, almost always they will shut you down. So you just, you won't get anything. Like no matter That's how fine. good a pitch you do, because they don't yeah. believe in the sector you're in or in you know the assumptions you have. They, and your assumptions in sector might, it, what you figured out might be really valid, but they have, you know, people have these built-in biases. They have these ideas that they've already formed about the market. So the key is finding people who are hot on what you're doing and approaching them. Number two, vet them. Like you, you know, you want to make sure, go to their website and all VCs, almost everyone puts their portfolio of companies on their website and angel investors, you can just ask. And literally when you contact them, before you set up a meeting, before you divulge all your inner secrets, ask them, do you have any companies that are directly competitive with what we're doing? You know, you have to give them some idea, a high level idea. And if they do, they will tell you like they're, um, they don't want to waste their time if they've already made an investment and their job is not to rip you off. Like that's not their job. Their job is to invest and, and they have a reputation. They have to be uh, straight with uh, entrepreneurs or the word gets out. The next thing is Google, do a search to see what their reputation is. Like, have they screwed over other entrepreneurs? Most of them haven't, but there are a few bad apples out there and you want to weed them out. And also go to their portfolio companies and, and you may contact them and ask, you know, is this person great to have around? Is there, are they a great investor? Um, mm -hmm. These are really important things. And then finally, when you go into pitch your investor, don't do all the talking. A lot of entrepreneurs feel like it's, they have to get all this information imparted to this investor in a short time. So they're ba 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 ba, you know, downloading all their information. You know, think about it. If you go to buy a, a television, a big screen TV, and you walk into the store, and the salesperson is just ba 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 every feature and every trying to sell you on their that TV. You know, you're like, Whoa. you know, <laughs> like you know, you get it's a hardcore sales. You do not. You, you, you want to walk out of the store. The really good salespeople listen. They listen and they engage with the investor and they let the investor ask questions. So you want the investor's brain turned on. You don't want them turning off because you're the 20th pitch they heard that day and they're tired and you're just spewing out stuff that they're not interested in. You want to get them interested. And that's why I always say pitching an inv investor is a dialogue a dialogue. And the more you can get them asking you questions, the higher your chance of closing. Good. Very good. Um, can you do a top, can you do like another top five for bootstrapping too? That was very good. It's right <laughs> off the cuff. Like we didn't, we didn't prep this stuff. That was very, very good. Bootstrapping. So when you're bootstrapping, um, uh, always, uh, there are a couple things you need to do right away. So before you build a product, and it depends on the size of the bootstrap. I still think a team is really important even when you bootstrap. So building a great team from the beginning when you're bootstrapping, great. But if you want to do a smaller business, you don't have to do that. But remember, uh, an entrepreneur's job is not to create demand. Like nobody, this is what people get confused about. They think as an entrepreneur, I am supposed to build this incredible new product, this incredible innovative product that will all of a sudden, when anybody sees it, they will fall in love with it and they will come to me. You know, I create demand, I pull them in. But honestly, 99% of the businesses that succeed, uh, that succeed of the successful ones are actually filling a demand that already exists in the world. You don't, you know, you don't create a demand out of nothing. Like people have these needs. And you are coming along with something that feels it. It could be a need for entertainment, like a new form of entertainment. Oh my God, this is so new and fresh. I love it, you know? But they were already looking to be entertained. If they weren't looking to be entertained, they're not your customer. Like, let's face it, they're, they're doing other things. They don't want that. If, if, if a customers out there in their business have a problem that they're dealing with, a lot of times they won't even know it's a problem because this is the way they've always done it. Like it's always been a lot of work to do this and they don't, they won't, they, if you went to them and asked them, 
you know, uh, what should I build? They wouldn't be able to tell you because they're like, no, we we do our business like this all the time. We've done it this way for the past 10 years. You know, we don't have any problems. But actually, when you when you figure out uh, something in their business that's really difficult for them to do, and then you build a much simpler solution and show them, all of a sudden that demand is there, right? It's it that demand is already there because they're like, you save me all this time or you'll save me all this money or you'll bring me new customers that I never could target before. Okay. Yeah, I I will I didn't know it was a problem, but now I can see like this is something I want solved. So I tell entrepreneurs, you know, when you're bootstrapping, be super flexible super flexible, super low cost. Don't build anything ahead of time. Go. The hardest thing you have to do is not building the product. It is never building the product. The hardest thing you have to do is figuring out what product to build. Like that's the hard part. So don't spend all this time building a product when you don't know it's right. You're going to have to, if you're in the rest, if you're trying to use technology to enhance the restaurant business, you need to go into the kitchen of a restaurant. You need to like work with the chef, work with the owner, find out what headaches they have, what, what really annoys them that they might not even know there could be a solution to. And then you see if you can come up with using new technology, that's why new technology is so valuable because it can do things that have never been done before. And these people uh, may not know it. You can bring that into their business and say, well, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? It doesn't cost you any money, just your time. That is the way. And then if, you, if there's real demand, honestly, they will st they will, you will know it because they will want to uh, pay you right away <laughs> to get that solution. They'll be like, can I have that tomorrow? Like, honestly, that's going to make my life so much easier, you know, or that's going to help our business be so much more profitable. If you, when you hear them that they really absolutely need your product, then you build it. Um, the only, so I just wanted to go, you know, through the next few steps and I appreciate also on the, on the bootstrapping component. I, very, very useful information for entrepreneurs because I think that they actually do get that um, backwards. I think they do try and build a product and just push it, push it, push it. It's almost like a, a square, you, you know, what, what's the saying? It's a square peg into a round hole. Um, and it just doesn't, it doesn't go, it doesn't work. And they'll spend tons of energy and time and resources trying to do this. And once you build it, you've made an investment. You know, most people like yeah. with, they make it, they don't want to give it up. Like they, they yeah. like, I spent six months building this. We're going to make it work. <laughs> but yeah. really. So no one to quit, no one to quit too. No one to yeah. quit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, so those are, those are sort of the, the, after reading through like the outline of the book, those are the, the chapter titles that made sense to me without reading through all of it. So there's a few more that I'm curious what these topics go into. So for example, uh, finding your mojo, um, growth leadership, following your own path. I'm curious what these mean and why they're important for entrepreneurship. There is one I didn't mention, which is building a billion dollar business. And I feel like that's a lot of the lessons that we probably already spoke about, just summarized. So the other three, like the, the finding your mojo, the growth leadership, following your own, what do those mean? So in the book, I, it's literally filled with everything I've learned over the past 20 years like being an entrepreneur working. So each section is actually, you get a lot of information. Like, you know, there's some books that have one big theme and they just kind of repeat it and give examples of that theme. And this book is really like, it's something that you can use. So each of these uh, sections has a lot in them. Like even like you could say, finding your mojo, yeah. it has a lot in it. There are, you know, of, of different areas that entrepreneurs need. Now I will give you some advice. One thing that is, and I can't go over the whole book because there's so much in yes. it. But no, no, thing, I know, I know. <laughs> one thing that's really important that many entrepreneurs fail at is they don't know their own limitations. Like we all want to believe we can do anything. And I, of course, am somebody that believes that entrepreneurs aren't necessarily born, but they can also be made. Now, I think it's like athletic ability. Like some people are born with great athletic ability like amazing athletic ability, but they have no desire really to be an athlete and they end up not being a great athlete. You know, they're just, it's just not in them. Um, other people are born with no athletic ability. And if they work really hard, they might become a mediocre athlete, you know, <laughs> because they just have yeah. none. Most people are born somewhere in the middle. So if you were born with some ability to be an entrepreneur, you can actually grow 
in that area. You can actually train yourself to become much, much better. Now, you still will have deficiencies. None of us are great at everything. So in a company, you need to learn what you're really good at. And you need to put 90% of your energy into what you are the best at, like the best in the world at, because that is how you outperform. And then you need to take, you may be able to do a lot of jobs, right? So you may have some graphic art ability. You may have some coding ability. You may have, you know, some project management ability, right? And you may be decent at those. But when it comes to sales, you are kick ass, right? Like you can sell anything. So I'm telling you, are you going to spend a, an hour or five hours or, you know, whatever a, a day working on things that you aren't good at? What, what does that mean? So I'm, I'm like building my website. I'm, you know, doing, uh, I'm coding on the side. Now I'm, I'm not that great at either of those, but I'm passable, but mm -hmm. you aren't selling, right? And really what you're great at is selling. If, if you are great at selling, you should be putting 90% of your time into selling and then getting other people to do all those other chores in your company. Now, this is really hard for a small company. Like when you're just beginning, you have no money, but I'm telling you, you need to find those people first. You need to sell those people, get them on board, get them doing what they are really good at, what they are at. Why would you have a mediocrely coded site? Why would you have a mediocrely designed site? Why would you have, you know, all these things at a mediocre level when you could have somebody much better than yourself strictly focused on that? So this is uh, really important. The next thing, uh, like in growth leadership that I really want to talk about is that teams, you don't, like I say, you need an incredible team, but you know, you're never going to get the superstars of the world. Like, you know, uh, you, 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 what you need are highly competent people. You don't need like the best person in the world at doing something. What they found is that the startups that actually outperform, the ones that outperform, they are not necessarily the startups with the all-star teams. Like some, they've done experiments and they've had teams where they've put like the best salesperson ever with the best engineer ever, like with the award-winning engineer, with the greatest, you know, uh, CT, uh, you know, uh, with the greatest marketing CMO ever, you know, all these amazing people together. But those teams, if they lack one ingredient, they will actually not work. They will become dysfunctional. And that ingredient is trust trust in the other people. Sometimes when you get all stars, they want to get all the credit for themselves. They want to mm. be the big person. They stab the other people in the back or undermine them or don't communicate because they feel like they're in competition with them. But when you get a great team, and this is like sports, you don't have to have all the best sports players on your team to win the championship. Now I found this out in Little League. Like I was in Little League. We had the worst team ever. So the first year, of Little League, we came in last place. The second year, we came in second to last place. The third year, our coach quit. So we had no coach. <laughs> and we were just awful. But by the third year, we all gelled. Like we loved each other. Every player on that team, like we were such good friends, right? We didn't care if we we're gonna lose. We we're stuck on this loser team. And somehow, by magic, we all came together. We just came together. And these teams with much better players, we not only made it to the championship, we won. Like, we won. And so I actually, and you see this in sports all the time. You see these teams, they might not have a LeBron James or, you know, somebody inc incredible on their team, but somehow they come out of nowhere and the team really bonds. This is what great coaches do. As a CEO, you are the coach. You want to, uh, you, your job is to create an environment where people trust each other, they know they have the back, and communication, they can communicate, they can work together. These teams that work together as a whole really, really well, you, you just need competent, really competent people, not the superstars, and you can outperform superstar teams. That's good advice, very good. Um, I appreciate that. We went into almost every chapter uh, in, in your book at a high level, so um, what I wanted to do, what I really wanted to do is, is just sort of give people a, a little bit of a taste of all the different components that you line up because you really, like I said, you really go through the entire journey that a, a, an entrepreneur will have to go through at some point in their in their career, right? Um, when Whenever I finish these off, I ask a couple of rapid fire questions just to bring stuff out from your career. Was there anything else that you wanted to go into that we didn't talk about or didn't touch on? 
So there's so much. Like if we I know. Another I know two there's hours, so much. I could. I could just. But you go can't. On. You can't. You can't talk yourself out of a book mm -hmm. sale. So <laughs> you, you, right. So you got to leave no, some. No. Yeah. No. But I. I could. I. 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 First of all, I want to say I love working with entrepreneurs, and I've now hit the road because our companies. Mm -hmm. You know, we're. We're, I'm going to be permanently traveling, so I'd love to come. You're in Toronto. I'd love to come yeah. and visit you, Scott. And maybe yeah, you know, COVID will be over by the time I get there, and we can do fingers, something fingers in person. A big, but if there are other of your entrepreneurs out there, your fans out there that want me to come to their city, give a talk, you know, work with you, just go to Founderspace, Founderspace.com. Reach out to me. I am also on all the social networks. Like I'm now on Clubhouse. I've found I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, you name it. I'm there. Just search for Founder Space. Reach out to me and let's engage. Because really what I want to do is I, I'm so happy that the pandemic is winding down because I love face-to-face -face interaction. Yes, I agree. I think that's probably been my biggest, uh, biggest not setback, but uh, a, a, an unfortunate circumstance of the pandemic is I can't do any of these in person. I would love to, you know, I'd love to, of course, the people in Toronto, but a lot of people in New York, a lot of people in uh, California that I'd like to sit down with and just do like a face to face chat. Cause I like face to face. It's more personal, right? Like and for podcasts, it's one thing, but also for networking, for meeting founders, for hearing their stories. It's just so much more meaningful when it's in person versus well, over Zoom or over over some sort of yeah, video chat, I, I'm right? zoomed out. But you know, I'm zoomed out it, too. <laughs> it's good for now, and I love podcasts because I can listen to them as I do other things. Like it's awesome. Sure. So I, I do that all the time, and you know, I love your podcast. Can't wait to meet you. Can't wait to meet other people. Uh, you know, all all your fans out In there. Person. I know you have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate. It. Um, okay, let's do some let's do some rapid fire questions. Um, if somebody uh, if you're going to um, dispel one myth about entrepreneurship, what would it be? I would dispel the myth that uh, that everybody can be a great entrepreneur. So a lot of people say, you know, just work hard enough, just do do everything you could do. You know, you you can be great. You could totally transform yourself. I will tell you honestly, there are some people who should not be entrepreneurs. And you know, it, 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 it's not for everybody. You know, you may be a brilliant, brilliant scientist, but if you try to be an entrepreneur, you just may fall on your face. You know, it may stress you out. People who can't deal with uncertainty, people who uh, can't uh, uh, d uh, deal with uh, finances going all over the place, people who have mm -hmm. trouble relating to other people. Like they may be really good at their field, but uh, being an entrepreneur is about being with other people, relating to other people, motivating other people. So there are things um, there. I say pick an area that's a natural fit for you, because if you're fighting against your core and I see a lot of entrepreneurs who shouldn't be entrepreneurs, it is going to be really difficult. Good. It's interesting advice. And it's actually I've never I've never heard that advice before, but it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, What's one piece of advice that you would tell your younger self? Ah, uh, so I, you know, I remember where every time I did a company, every time I, you know, was involved in the process, you know, when things are getting a little crazy, I would think it could be the end of the world. Like you take these things so seriously. Um, so if, if like right now, I don't care if what I do succeeds or fails. Like, I don't think it reflects on who I am because I know I am whoever I am. Like whoever I am with all my flaws and I know my flaws now and all my abilities, I know my abilities, that's who I am. I can't change that. I can work harder, yes. I can uh, try to do uh, uh, many, many new things, but I should not blame myself when things go wrong. I should not, we are our own worst enemies. Like we stress ourselves out. We play this tape recording in our head, you know, that it's our fault, we're failing or everything's gonna go wrong. You need to stop doing that. Like if you're really gonna be, I became really successful, honestly, when I, when I stopped doing that, when I stopped pushing myself too hard, when I started to laugh at myself, 
laugh at the problems and just take them as they come. And if, wow, if this whole thing goes to hell and it doesn't work out, well, I'll do something else. If I'm still alive, if I'm still breathing, yeah. if I still have energy, I there's always something I can do. And if I'm not alive and I'm not breathing and I don't have energy, well, then so be it. <laughs> I, I yeah. don't care at that yeah. point. So that's what I tell yeah. people. Good. Um, what's a, what's a resource? Uh, it could be a podcast. It could be a book, um, that you would suggest people go read or listen to. Well, of course your podcast, <laughs> Scott. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it has to be, it has to be something else though. It has to I be know, something I know. else. I'm joking around. So <laughs> there are so many great, uh, resources out there. Um, I love, uh, you know, I love the book shoe dog by the founder of Nike, mm -hmm. Phil Knight which tells his personal story of everything he went through uh, to be an entrepreneur, really great. We also, um, I have a, uh, something special to offer your listeners. Like okay. if, if, you know, my book is just coming out now from HarperCollins, Surviving a Startup. If you go to Founderspace and uh, you'll see it there, um, if you buy the book now, we will give you our online startup program, which includes our startup kit, which has all these resources for entrepreneurs. Nice. It includes nice. all these videos we created, all these business lessons, all that free. Like you just pay what you would pay normally for the book and we, we mm -hmm. give this to you. Um, so all they need to do is go to founderspace.com slash promo, P-R-O-M-O. And that, and they can. Okay. Yeah. I'll link that below. I didn't know you were doing that. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate yeah. it. That's very kind. And I'll put that in the, I'll put that in the show notes. Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll make sure that the, like when I, blast this out on social um i'll link that as well so people oh. can go actually get the book and get that deal because that's very nice awesome um very good and last question that i ask everybody uh, what does success mean to you well you know it's hard because we all define success success by how society defines it right and by how our peers define it unfortunately most of the world is very money obsessed, right? So we measure everything in terms of how many dollars you bring in. But uh, yeah. I've learned that there are a lot of other ways to define success uh, that can allow you to feel a lot better about yourself and make better decisions. So first of all, when you're just defining it by money, it takes out all the human element right? Like how you treat people, what type of company culture you build, about what, how your products are used in the world, you know, the end result of these products. It takes all that out. It's just like, what is the cash in your bank account? And honestly, at the end of the day, well, you're not taking that cash with you. Like <laughs> when you die, you may leave it to somebody else if you want. But honestly, there's always somebody richer out there. There's always somebody ahead of you, no matter how much money you earn, unless you just happen to be the richest person in the world, which is very unlikely. Um, so <laughs> my advice to you is if you truly want to be independent, if you truly want to be uh, the master of your own destiny, start with success. There's no better way than to define success according to your values. What do you value in life uh, besides just get, you know, making money? Do you value uh, creating great jobs for people? Do you value giving them a great place to work? Do you value uh, putting products into the world that make it a better place? List these out and they can become not just, they can become your guide for your company, right? Your philosophy and they can inform the entire company and they can help you actually achieve a much deeper, greater, longer lasting success. Very good. Um, and then the most important, where do people actually go to reach out to you, connect with you, social and website? Yeah, so uh, Founderspace. Uh, uh, okay. you know, just type in founderspace.com, you can go there. Uh, it has everything. You can also like on every social network, founder space. I made it super simple. So, and, <laughs> well, that's okay. That's easy enough. That's not going to yeah. be too complicated. <laughs> All right.